Okay, let's get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nisha Talagala from Fusion IO, and Rick invited me here today to talk to you about some of the things that we've been doing with new interfaces and non-volatile memory. So, quick show of hands. How many people here um, were at Rick's talk this morning? Oh, excellent. So, I'll try to sort of pick up where he left off. And so, one of the things that he talked about was, you know, sort of the ar arrival or pending arrival or the perpetually pending arrival of the new memories and, you know, some of the sort of the crawl, walk, run kind of approaches that we can take to, you know, figuring out how to deal with them. And so, what I'm going to share with you today is some of the things that we've done at Fusion IO, which pretty much, you know, depending on what you're talking about, fall into either the crawl, the walk, or the run category. And some of the software that uh, we've written as part of the process that we are planning on open sourcing or are in various stages of being open sourced. So, essentially, kind of the progression that we've gone down just to very, you know, at a very, very high level of, uh, you know, talking about starting with Flash and then moving to some of the other new memories is, you know, people have started looking at Flash as sort of a hierarchy between, you know, non-volatile memory and disk drives or as a straightforward replacement of a disk drive. So, there are quite a few big data centers now that are effectively going all Flash. So, they have, you know, so Flash has become cheap enough that it, there are people who are pulling out disk drives entirely from their data centers now. So, the, the place where these APIs and these new interfaces sort of come into the mix is when we talk about using in one form or another Flash and these new, you know, upcoming NVMs as forms of memory as well as sort of non-block forms of I.O. So, you know, the, the devices that at least we make and most SSD vendors make today live, you know, present themselves to the world as simple block devices regardless of how they're built internally. And there's a variety of different ways that these devices are built internally. So, when we decided to create sort of new APIs and new interfaces uh, along with uh, a bunch of other companies, we broke these new interfaces down into effectively I.O. oriented models and memory oriented models. And the reason we did that is because in talking to sort of our customers and people who write software that runs on our devices, it was fairly obvious that, you know, every programmer either loved to program the memory way or loved to program the I.O. way. And if they've been doing one of those for a really long time, then they really are just going to continue to do that. And they're not really going to switch over to the other one. And so, you know, it's sort of imperative that you have, you know, support people who think about the world as I.O. as in, I send a request, sometime later I get the response back, and my program was sort of structured from the ground up to deal with that. And then the group of people who think ID reference a pointer and something happens. And my program was structured from the ground up to look like that. And so, kind of with that in mind, we sort of created effectively two kinds of um, uh, I, what, what you would call programming models or APIs or interfaces, where some of them fall into the I.O. category, where no matter what they do, they essentially look like an I.O. model, a request or response. And then a set that, you know, fall into the memory category, such that regardless of what they do, they fall into the, you know, I M map something or I, you know, malloc something and then I, you know, use pointers to reference it and then I manipulate memory and certain things happen. So, we actually kind of structured both of them and in terms of the um, way we sort of handle media is we put both of them to work on effectively a hierarchy of NVMs. So, all of these or a majority of them work on Flash. They also work on a hierarchy of quote unquote new NVM and Flash. So, the, um, the, the I.O. oriented interfaces that we've created sort of fall into a few categories. Primarily, the uh, changes that we made to the I.O. interfaces are to add in addition to the existing block read and write kind of things. Um, transactional updates. So, we have, you know, atomic writes, for example, which we developed with HP and Rob, who's here, you know, are one of the biggest, you know, changes that we made to uh, sort of enhance the I.O. interface model. We also have a set of interfaces that we've created that are slightly higher level, that are more key value kind of get put kind of interfaces that are essentially, you know, provided by libraries that are 
that tie those interfaces very closely to flash and NVM behavior. In the land of memory access, what we did is we sort of divided the memory access into sort of a spectrum that ranges from purely volatile at one end, which we call extended memory, and purely non-volatile byte addressable fine-grained updates at the other end, which we call auto-commit memory. And things that sort of sit in the middle, where, which are, you know, can be checkpointed to persistence, but most of the time are volatile. And so this, and this again is, this is a, um, how do I put this? This is a programmer's view that is not necessarily the same as the hardware view. So you can actually take any of these models and implement them on the other hardware. They will just get cheaper and slower or, you know, more expensive and faster, depending on how you look at it. So just to kind of give you an idea of, you know, sort of how we think about this, and I, this is sort of should be, you know, a repeat of what was in the previous slide. IO semantics means you open a file descriptor, you, you know, read, you write, you seek, you close. This is the standard stuff. What is ad added to this is something like a vectored transactional write. You can write multiple blocks atomically or you can open up a key value interface, you can get and put, you know, immutable objects, you can do this in groups and so forth. The um, memory access, pretty much the same way you would do before, you know, you allocate virtual memory, you do with it the same things you would always do with it, but, you know, you would be able to do this somewhat performantly through a hierarchy of, you know, DRAM and flash. In the land of purely non-volatile memory, as in purely non-volatile persistent memory, you know, the, the notion here is that you would allocate persistent memory, you would map it to your virtual address space, you may call something like a checkpoint if you want to create a consistent version of it, and, you know, have the ability to both name it as well as, you know, remap it back to the same or a different virtual address upon restart. And then what you do with it above in the terms of, you know, the data structures you build on top of it and so forth are sort of another layer that can be developed, you know, almost independently. So, um, so we've actually developed a good chunk of these things and we've, and the way we've sort of done this and this kind of speaks to some of the things that Rick was mentioning is, you know, developing a lot of these new interfaces, they're hard. You've got this sort of chicken and egg problem. You know, you've got the interface, then you've got the app that doesn't exist, you know, and without the app, you don't have the interface, without the interface, you don't have the app, and then it goes on and on. So what we've sort of done is we've kind of attacked the problem sort of at every possible angle. So we developed some interfaces that were there so that applications could use it. We modified some applications so that we could see how the interfaces could be used, and simultaneously we worked through the standards bodies to you know, put process, you know, proposals for the underlying commands that, you know, are the primitives, uh, you know, through the standards process. And so one of the things that we did, you know, one of the very first things that we did in this area was for atomics. And so the primitive here is a fairly simple primitive. The idea is that you can take a single I.O. and execute it atomically. And this happens to be a very good fit for a flash device because flash devices are naturally actually do this because of their, you know, uh, you know, right anywhere kind of nature. And so they actually can be done very fast. And so this particular one, you know, we implemented it as part of our FTL. And then we started out by integrating it with the MySQL database. And this is basically where we see, you know, saw some of the initial sort of use cases for it. So because it's implemented as, um, you know, part of the native capabilities of the non-volatile memory. It's almost as fast as the non-volatile memory, but, uh, you know, uh, in terms of as almost as fast as just doing regular writes. But because you are now making this capability available to an application, then the application can avoid some of the redundant writing that it does with logs and so forth. And so at the application level, it results in about half as much writing as you would do otherwise. So. This is an example of, you know, the MySQL database through our file system translation layer that is doing atomic writes. 
So, what happens here is you know prior to integration with atomic rights, if you had um, you know fully acid compliant databases, then it was doing you know logging and multiple writing of data to you know maintain acid compatibility. If you turned off that multiple writing, then you lost your transactional correctness, but your performance got a lot larger. When you use the native atomic IO capability, you get about the same amount of performance as you would get in the non-transactional case previously, but now you are fully transactionally safe at the same time. So this is sort of an example of the, you know, the kind of um, um, you know, benefits that you can get sort of by integrating the primitives kind of level. So this particular case, for example, the two um, major forks of MySQL, MariaDB and Percona, both support the atomic primitive now. So MariaDB supports it in the mainline code, and Percona has published patches for it. So, so those who are sort of, you know, kind of an example of how we've sort of worked from the application to the, you know, FTL to the standards. And this was mostly done through a kind of a somewhat iterative process involving the database and then us sort of, you know, refining our work on it and then, you know, going back and forth. And it took a little while, but, you know, it gives you an example of, you know, some of the ways that we've sort of done some application work that can be, you know, made available. And I don't know, Rob, if you want to comment on the standards for this, you know, stuff. Do you have your... Who's got the microphone? Hello? Yeah, in uh, T10, the SCSI standards body, we've been standardizing uh, SCSI commands to do atomic writes and atomic reads, as well as a scatter gather I.O. Uh, no, it's a new command called write atomic and read atomic, and, a new, and also a write command it's called write scattered and read gathered. Um, that's implementation dependent. Yeah, in our implementations, you can write up to four gigabytes. That's our current implementation. Yes. Or uh, in, in our implementation, a total vector size of four gigabytes. They don't have to be contiguous. The way the uh, T10 standards written, the device reports its maximum sizes. So software can adapt yeah. to that and decide if it's big enough to work with it or not. Yeah, so we support eff effectively a form of a capabilities query, which you can query, and it will tell you that Atomics is supported, here's the maximum size, here's the maximum number of non-contiguous elements it will deal with, stuff like that, which is sort of a, a softer interpretation of what you have in the standards. So, yeah, and then I think I have a link uh, later in these slides to the act active proposals that these guys have in the works. So. So um, the next sort of major area that I'll go over is essentially sort of the plumbing exercise that's involved in getting some of these, you know, APIs. So one of the things is that when you have the API that surfaces from a device, practically speaking, no one is going to use that API unless they can also have it with a file namespace. And so because the file namespace is so closely tied in to all the data management that people do, and so even if they have their primary application is doing, you know, fast access through some sort of a custom API, every primary application that's serious enough to do that has an ecosystem of secondary applications around it that are, you know, their backups, their utilities, their other, you know, random maintenance things that are not going to change to go through the, you know, new APIs. And so as a result, sort of in, as part of this kind of crawl, walk, run thing, even if you have APIs sort of surfaced, you, you know, by say a device or a new kind of device, you also need th that same data to be accessed through standard APIs, you know, file, read, write kind of things for the rest of these sort of the ecosystem surrounding that app. And so one of the things that we built is what we call a native file system. Now, so this one is an interesting thing in that it sort of serves two purposes for us. It's a file system that is developed from the ground up to be optimized for non-volatile memory. And so even if you don't use it with these, you know, for these APIs, 
It is also the fastest file system we have to date right now for accessing our devices because it is almost as fast as a raw device. It has the second benefit that if you want to use these APIs, then you can actually use them through a you know, POSIX compliant file system and that in every other respect it will function as a regular file system. And so this is a, a piece of code that um, we have developed internally. It will, its lead developer is Nick Piggin whom I think many of you might know. And uh, it is something that we are going to open source you know, before the end of the year. It plugs into the VFS layer the same as any other file system. Primary difference is that it really supports you know, flash and other kinds of NVM devices. So yeah, so a few notes on DirectFS. Uh, it appears like any other file system in Linux. You can run unmodified applications on it. You know, some of the people that are using it in trials right now are using it just for that. They're not, you know, even using it for the primitives. But it also exposes the primitives. Now, the fundamental difference between DirectFS and, you know, most of the other file systems out there is, if you think about a file system, you know, it it performs a few different functions. It provides a namespace. It typically does block management. It has some kind of you know, crash recovery, you know, consistency kind of capability to it. So DirectFS is different in that it actually only provides a namespace. It sort of recognizes the fact that non-volatile memories do their own block allocations and their own capacity management in a way that's very specific <coughs> to that non-volatile memory. So Flash, for example, does wear leveling and things like that. The new non-volatile memories do a whole other thing entirely. And so what DirectFS does is it uses an abstracted namespace that's based on virtual addresses and not physical addresses. And it basically leverages the block management and the capacity management in the underlying NVM and adds only file names and directory hierarchies. It also relies upon capabilities like the atomics that essentially allow it to um, benefit from the fact that the underlying device is a persistent, consistent, crash safe device and therefore it actually has no journal of its own. And so as a result, it's actually an extremely thin layer of code. And so the current DirectFS is a fully functional file system and is, I believe, somewhere between 8,000 and 9,000 lines of code. So. so this gives you sort of a, you know, cartoonish view of what, uh, you know, how DirectFS looks relative to some of the other FSs. So DirectFS maintains the metadata management. It has notions of inodes, has notions of virtual extents, you know, keeps names, directories, permissions, things like that. But it does not do any block allocation. It doesn't do any mapping. It doesn't do any journaling. You know, it doesn't do any crash recovery. It is fully, it moves from consistent state to consistent state through the primitives available at the lower layer and has something like four different primitives that it interacts with the underlying NVM as. And those four primitives are, have all been, you know, stated publicly and we're in this, in various stages of introducing them to the, com the standards communities. The atomics is the most fundamental one. So this is a quick example of sort of some of the pa performance that DirectFS gets. And so the way to kind of think about it is um, the measure of DirectFS for I.O. oriented um, applications is we want it to be as close to the raw device performance as possible. And so what this chart has is, you know, IOPS or bandwidth in megabytes per second for random I.O. for, you know, various sizes. And in each of the cases, one of the bars is raw and the other bar is direct FS. And we typically get, you know, anywhere from like, say, 2 to 5 percent, within 2 to 5 percent of raw performance for direct FS because of the, you know, very low code path and the very, you know, very, very simple sort of nature of what it does. Uh, what this chart has is essentially a slightly different thing, but for these primitives. So if you have a primitive like atomic rights, you can access that primitive through the raw device or you can access it through a DirectFS file. And what this shows is that the performance of the primitive is nearly identical, whether you get it through the raw device or through the file. 
And so this uh, you know, helps people to sort of adopt the primitive because they get the file namespace for their regular data management tasks. And they don't, you know, cost, it doesn't cost them a great deal in performance. So another um, area that I, I'll talk to very briefly about um, is essentially the uh, sort of the notion of like say supporting KV kinds of APIs, you know, for, for typically common NoSQL types of applications. Many of the NoSQL applications, you know, they are distributed, you know, in their nature, but inside each of the nodes support some form of a get and put kind of, you know, model. And some of these models can be uh, adapted fairly well to Flash by recognizing sort of certain things. So, for example, one of the things that you can recognize is that um, many of the um, Many, many of the KV, KV stores frequently have a notion of key expiry about them. So keys and information is only valid for a certain amount of time. And after that, it basically just expires. And so if you, when you combine the notion of that expiry with the underlying garbage collection of the flash, you can actually get a lot of effectiveness so that it can essentially auto-expire information and reduce the write amplification considerably. And those are sort of the kinds of things that you can you know, combine with when you you know, try to understand sort of how common access patterns that are key, key value store oriented can be mapped onto flash devices. And so this is one of the things that, you know, we've done with some of our KV types of APIs. And the way that we've structured this in particular is this lives pretty much entirely on top of the primitives, the same primitives that drive DirectFS. And so this is effectively a user level library that we also intend to open source that sits on top of the same set of primitives. So people don't necessarily have to use this, but if they have a KV kind of application, you know, they can essentially put this on top of the previous, you know, primitives layer and use that to sort of adapt the underlying capabilities to this kind of an access model. So these are some of the, some performance numbers that compare sort of our KV implementation with, in this case, memcache DB. And so, I mean, it's a, it's a fairly straightforward thing, you know. The memcache DB doesn't have an iterate, which is why the iterate chart doesn't have multiple lines. But, the, um, but in the other cases, what you're really seeing here is that, you know, there are scaling limits in this particular um, case of memcache DB that are, you know, essentially show up at larger number of threads and it doesn't allow it to get the full usage of the flash device. And, you know, if you have something that's a little bit better tune to what is going on underneath in the flash device itself, you can just scale a lot better. So, I mean, this is specific to memcache DB. It does, it's not a general problem with KV stores, but we've also done some integration with Redis, for example, and we see some benefits when, you know, sort of integrating with something like Redis. And Redis is a very um, commonly used, you know, KV library. So, any questions on those before I move on? Okay. So um, going to some of the uh, memory access kind of, so those were some of the previous things that I talked about were some of the I.O. oriented models that we've talked about and what we've developed. Um, so going to more of the memory oriented models, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, we've sort of chosen to divide our memory oriented work into something like three different areas. One is what we call extended memory, and extended memory is basically fast swap. The idea is that there are people who want to use large amounts of DRAM, but they can't afford to do it either because there just aren't machines that can actually have that much DRAM in it, or if they want to have a large amount of DRAM, they end up with very expensive DIMMs or four socket machines or something that essentially makes it you know, impractical. And so what we want is to create hierarchies of DRAM and flash that people use like virtual memory. At the other end, we have what we call auto commit memory, which is essentially um, support for physical persistent memory of the kind of things that we talked about this morning, you know, things that show up as physical memory, you know, either on PCIe or on the memory bus and are byte addressable and byte level persistent. And, you know, what we put in the middle, which we call checkpointed memory, is the ability to take that same set of persistent memory APIs, but realize them through hierarchies of DRAM and flash. Because, you know, to the point made this morning, everyone isn't going to have a persistent memory. 
in their machine. And so if you have you know, APIs that work for persistent memory, you also need those APIs to do something halfway intelligent when there is no persistent memory in the machine. So the checkpointed memory is the ability to get the persistent memory API without the persistent memory through a hierarchy of DRAM and flash. So um, the work that we've done for extended memory is actually available on GitHub as a set of patches. They are patches to improve the performance of swap. And they primarily kind of, you know, if you think about sort of swap, you know, swap was never intended to be actively used as a hierarchy of DRAM and anything. You know, swap is a last resort, you know, kind of, you know, failure avoidance kind of thing. And so it makes a bunch of decisions that are appropriate for hierarchies of DRAM and disk, such as, you know, it takes a lot of time to figure out um, how, what page should be replaced, you know, when you move data between disk and DRAM. And that is not the right decision when you're dealing with a hierarchy of DRAM and flash. So uh, a lot of this, this is, this is all public. It's available for people to test. And, you know, in, at least in our internal benchmarks, it's shown a fairly dramatic improvement over what is there already. And the key here is that if you want to, you know, tier data between DRAM and flash, the best you can do is to exhaust the performance of the flash device. You can't do any better than that. And so, you know, in, in the internal tests that we've done, this, uh, these changes can keep up with something like three of our fastest devices ganged up together. And so that's a, you know, that pushes the, the swap subsystem you know, to a, a much better place than it currently is. So. so, so that's kind of, that's sort of the stuff that we've done for, um, for extended memory. And from a programming model kind of perspective, there is no programming model changes for extended memory. It is intended to be swap. It's just swap running faster. So in every other respect, it's expected to behave like swap. Um, for the land of persistent memories, the model that we've essentially provided here, the model that we've created so far, and this stuff is sort of very early in its development, is we see the memory as being part of a file system. You know, it is part of the file system namespace. And so the, the, the way that we've actually done it so far is that you have a file system. In this case, it happens to be DirectFS. And that file system supports both flash and the persistent memory and hierarchies of DRAM and flash as ways to represent the file. And you can use, you know, read and write access to the file, but you can also use things like MMAP and extensions to MMAP as ways to sort of access the file. And you can create checkpoints of these persistent memories, and those checkpoints present themselves as DirectFS files by another name, and you can do anything you would do with them that you would do with any file. So when you create a checkpoint, it shows up as another DirectFS file with the name of your choosing. And so the idea is that it integrates with the existing storage namespace, but is internally sort of able to comprehend this notion of, you know, multiple different media types, some of it being flash and some of it being, uh, you know, something that isn't flash. And the amount of it that you have is going to really depend on, you know, what's available. So, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of expectation that these new memories will show up and they'll be the price of DRAM. Chances are before they hit that point, they will be more expensive than DRAM for a while. And then they will become the price of DRAM. And then if they're successful, they will become cheaper than DRAM. And if they're really successful, they will become cheaper than flash. So at any point in time, there's going to be some amount of it. And sort of the approach that we've taken to this is we are not assuming a certain amount of it. We're assuming that there will always be a hierarchy. And depending upon how much is practical, there will be different usages. You know, there are things we can do with a very tiny amount of it. There are things we can do with a medium amount. And there are other things we can do with huge amounts of it. So we're, you know, so from an, but from an architectural approach, we haven't assumed a certain amount. We just assume there will always be it will always be part of a tier, not, you know, a thing all to its own. <clears throat> 
So um, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe three or four weeks ago, we announced a sort of a, a demonstrated an integration of this, uh, of a form of persistent memory with software. And what we did here is we, you know, we have a small amount of persistent memory that's essentially part of one of our devices. It presents itself to the operating system as physical memory. We essentially have a kernel module that takes ownership of this physical memory and doles it out to any, through an API to anyone who wants it. Uh, so, so effectively, it shows up as a number of pages. Those pages are then, you know, they are accessible, they're physical memory, so they are, you know, granular, they support byte and cache line updates. So then what, we'll, you know, so this kernel module that we have essentially owns this memory and has, and there is an API by which other kernel modules can get access to the memory pages. And we have, you know, some mechanisms that you can recover the pages and things like that after they, you know, after a restart. This, uh, these pages are consumed by DirectFS, you know, as it needs, as, you know, another physical sort of persistent resource that it can get access to, and is surfaced up to applications as, you know, part of a DirectFS file. And then what we uh, put on top of that is that through a set of user-level libraries, we integrated this persistent memory with uh, a MySQL database simulator called InnoSim and used it to accelerate the log writing of that database. So a log writing is a, one of the usages that you can do with a very small amount of persistent memory because the, um, because the access pattern is predictable. So if you had you know, highly random, highly unpredictable persistent memory you, you know, or workload pattern, you actually need a lot of persistent memory. Otherwise, you'd be thrashing your cra uh, cache like crazy. But, um, but when you're trying to accelerate a log, you actually don't need all that much. And so what you see here in this um, chart is three lines. The, um, the blue line is this particular um, database simulator when it's running all on flash, data on flash, logs on flash. The dark blue or almost black line is when we actually turn off the logs. So by turning off the logs, it's like, how fast would this database run if its logs were infinitely fast? And actually, sorry, the yellow line is when we turn off the logs. The dark blue or black line is when we put the logs on a persistent memory. So you can see that you know, by putting the logs on a persistent memory, and, a, and database logs are typically the place where you know, the performance of a commit is driven because it's usually when you write to the log is when you commit the transaction. And so when you take the logs and you accelerate them <laughs> by putting them on a persistent memory, then you get almost as much performance as if you turned off the logs entirely. And incidentally, about twice as much as the performance of if you were logging to the flash itself. So the underlying flash in all of these cases is the same. And the logs basically present themselves as DirectFS files. And to the rest of the you know, ecosystem around the database, they are as accessible as they always were. They are effectively at a file, and so your backup utilities see them as the same files that they've always seen them. So what we see when we actually do this and we try to you know, access an application, from an application, what we see when we try to access, say, a DirectFS file that is backed by a persistent memory is, is you know, the kind of the expected substantial latency reduction because you're not going through the I.O. stack anymore. You know, you're doing CPU store operations with, you know, certain operations to flush CPU caches and the like, and the latency reductions are substantial. The other interesting sort of thing is that, you know, if you are, you know, if you're doing small updates and you're going through, you know, a file system that is forced to turn those small updates into four kilobyte writes, it ends up doing a lot of four kilobyte writes. Whereas if those updates were doing their native sizes because they are now in cache line multiples, it turns out that even when you destage the flash, you end up writing a lot less to the flash. And it's a very, very noticeable amount that you can write, you know, in terms of the savings of the writes to the flash themselves. And then, you know, obviously, you know, we get a lot better CPU overhead. So in this particular case, I think um, 
we're able to do something like somewhere between 9 and 10 million updates to this memory with one CPU core. And that's simply because you're not over, you know, going through the stack. And uh, yeah, and we already talked about sort of some of the DirectFS kind of integration. So what we have is a combination of sort of an extended MMAP and a form of API. So you can do an extended MMAP that says, I can MMAP my file into persistent memory. So the file is re resident on flash, but where previously you would have mapped a flash resident thing into DRAM, you now map it into persistent memory. So this notion of you know, being able to destage data back and forth is still present. You know, we also have some native, more I-O-oriented APIs just because for applications that are doing logging, for example, doing an I-O-oriented API is much more friendly to them. They, they already know how to do that. And then, you know, the point made earlier, you know, a lot of this is, sim is about doing tiering. So the half the battle of dealing with, you know, medi medium amounts of persistent memory is knowing how to tier it. Um, in some areas, yes, but um, yes, a uh, question is, do we have any comparisons between the IO oriented model and the memory oriented model? Um, we do, but I'm trying to think of whether there's something I can say that's sort of meaningful. I think, I think the crux of it is that um, they're just two very different patterns. And so, for example, when we're dealing with the persistent memories, you know, the mem copies and other things that show up when you do the I.O. oriented model show up as real overheads because, you know, we're talking about a place where individual CPU cycles matter, right? So we can tell when something takes, you know, several hundred nanoseconds as opposed to 200 nanoseconds, for example. On the other hand, you know, when you're dealing with hierarchies of flash and DRAM, for example, one of the problems with the memory oriented model is that it is inherently synchronous. So every thread can only have one I.O. outstanding. Whereas the I.O. oriented model is lovely in that, you know, every thread, if it uses AIO, can have a large amount of I.O.s outstanding. And so the I.O. oriented model can actually do better in that case. So we do have the comparisons, but there is no clear win there on either side. I think, you know, uh, so for, the, for some of the persistent memory stuff that we've done, I mean, we, can, we see a notable overhead for the I.O. oriented model. Any other questions? Okay. So just, uh, you know, just sort of a reference for some of the open source stuff that we're doing and have done. Uh, at the application level, um, so some of the atomics integration with MariaDB is, uh, so MariaDB, for those of you who don't know, is a fork of the MySQL, you know, database. And MySQL is by far the most popular open source database out there right now. Uh, the MariaDB code, you know, support for Atomics is part of their main line. The Percona for, branch has support for Atomics as part of a downloadable patch. Uh, we have some other work, you know, sort of in development at the database and some other areas that uh, we're not announcing right now, but hopefully can once they're more mature. The primitives that we've developed, uh, we intend to publish the interfaces to them. We also intend to open source DirectFS, which is both a and it, it's also it's a standalone you know functional file system, but it's also a good example of how the primitives are com consumed and re-exported. So the primitives you know sort of in code can be seen in the um, you know in the DirectFS, and then the various API libraries that sit in user space are all intended to be open sourced. We have um, some um, proposals in flight in SCSI. Uh, standards committee in T10 that Rob alluded to that we've been, you know, working on with our partners like HP, and I've listed a couple of them here, the ones for the atomic rights and for some of the vectored forms of the atomic rights, and we're also, um, you know, an active member in the CI NVM programming twig. Yeah, so can you use DirectFS on other uh, non-volatile memory technologies, or is it currently just uh, Fusion I.O. parts? Currently, it's just Fusion I.O., but this is what I was referring to. Sort of DirectFS relies on something like four different primitives. 
and we've got standards, you know, proposals in the works for all of them. You know, um, I, I, ideally, I would also like us to develop sort of a layer that helps DirectFS run on top of others, but we haven't, you know, we haven't announced such a thing yet. Yeah. Um, I have one question. So you said that the disadvantage of the non-volatile memory against the I.O.-oriented model is that you don't have asynchronous I.O. with the non-volatile memory. Yeah. Well, no. I, what I meant is that sort of think of it this way. The memory access model, it's not about non-volatile memory. But oh the memory yeah, access yeah. model is inherently yeah. synchronous. But I yes. is it really? Because you know the CPU does stuff like prefetch of the data. You know, so so it does actually some prefetching. Yes, it and, does some prefetching. Uh, like reordering and so on. So inherently, CPU itself does something equivalent of, uh, of asynchronous writes yeah, or reads. Yeah, and this is this is what sort of it comes down to, and it's true not just for the CPU, but also if you're doing tiering of DRAM and flash, right? When you have the application only being yeah. able to ask for one thing at a time per thread, then you probably want to do some prefetch and some write behind if you want to get more parallelism yeah, out of the flash. Yeah, but CPUs time. already are doing this, yeah, with the ordinary memory. So yeah, so I think, um, you know, we have So it's just the different scale? That it's a different scale. It's so a different so scale. that the NVRAM is slower so like CPU would have to be much more aggressive in prefetching. Yeah things. and also it's you know it depends on the I.O. pattern right like for example with asynchronous I.O. I can fetch a bunch of completely unrelated completely arbitrary things from the I.O. device well, yeah, whereas but prefetch is you know as smart well, as prefetch Well if you would be like the CPU you know looks ahead into the code yeah, and tries yeah. to guess what you would need and prefetch this from the memory. Yeah, it's so. plausible it's certainly plausible. Yeah. Yeah. So in theory, there shouldn't be such a. It's big quite. Interface. It's certainly plausible. Yeah. I don't think we've done enough work to know how effective it is right now for what we're doing, but the theory can be applied, certainly. Yeah. Any other questions? No. So um, that's pretty much everything that I had. Uh, the one other point I was going to make was there was a reference this morning about the block I.O. stack. Uh, I don't know if Jens is here, but I wanted to just add a pointer to the work that he has been doing to scale the block I.O. stack that was presented recently, and, you know, there's a link. They basically, they've been doing a whole bunch of stuff with multiple queues and have demonstrated something like 3 million IOPS out of the block I.O. stack, you know, and some, something like 10 million with a very large number of cores, but there's a bunch of detail in there. So, and I'm sure he'll be here shortly to tell you much more than that. So, that's pretty much everything I had. Any other questions? All right, thank you guys. <laughs>